Ghosts Advance on Cherbourg. From 30 to 50,000 Nazis were trapped by General Omar Bradley's 1st United States Army closing in on Cherbourg. Bitter street fighting marks the last stage of the push, and G.I. Joe is wary of Nazi snipers. But the Yanks can do a bit of sniping themselves. Meanwhile, it's no place for French civilians. Cherbourg streets are a shambles as our troops drive doggedly toward the harbor. Napoleon was primarily responsible for the heavy fortifications guarding this rich prize. Yank artillery cracks down on a Nazi bastion in the harbor as point-blank firing raises the last German stronghold. Bangalore torpedoes blast barbed wire. And this is the beginning of the end. Cherbourg's grim defenders surrender. As the Allied liberation of France rolls forward, thousands of Hitler's hordes fall into our hands. During the first 30 days of the Norman campaign, the Germans suffered 75,000 casualties. Our own men show the scars of battle too. And the enemy receives humane care as a German Red Cross nurse treats Nazi wounded. With the defenses reduced to rubble, General von Schlieben, military commander of Cherbourg's fortresses, surrenders. With him is Admiral Henneke, who received Hitler's Iron Cross for destroying Cherbourg's port facilities. Major General Joseph Collins dictates terms of surrender to von Schlieben. After leaving Allied headquarters, the high command joins the lowly stormtrooper in an advance to the rear. And now it's double time to oblivion for those who once shouted defiance from the vaunted Atlantic Wall. Wives of Russians who joined up with the Nazis weep for fear their captured husbands will be shot as promised by their Nazi leaders. The only sign of Adolf on the Western Front where his humble legions are cared for. The great Gare Maritime, from which thousands of transatlantic passengers took trains to Paris or boats for home, was wrecked by the Germans. Mines, which were too late. Also near the harbor, Yanks discover a takeoff for robot bombs. Wrecked railway bridges are quickly repaired. With the streets cleared, the victors formally enter the city. General Collins arrives at the city hall. These are newsreel and signal corps pictures. Paul Reynaud welcomes the Yanks. At the end of his speech, General Collins presents the flag of France to the city. The general returns Cherbourg to the French, but it seems G.I. Joe is going to take it back any minute.
subtle bombings have given our fortresses an added punch. Leaving from bases in England or Italy, they strike at their objectives and then continue to new bases that have been established in the Russian Ukraine. Here they refuel and load fresh bombs for another raid on the way home. This time we blast at both Hungary and Romania from Italy before continuing on to one of our new Russian bases. There's always a reception committee on hand with a warm welcome. Ambassador Harriman and General Aker greet the flyers who see some real Russian entertainment. Their brief stays between trips have endeared our flyers to the Russians, allies with one common purpose, victory. The symbol of liberty in Richmond, California, the 519th Liberty Ship built on the West Coast is about to be launched as Henry J. Kaiser presents Miss Lita Warner, the sponsor, with a bouquet. And Jack Warner, movie magnate, signs the ship, named for his father, Benjamin Warner. Harry Warner, another of the famous Warner brothers, also signs. <laughs> Miss Warner is a granddaughter of the pioneer for whom the ship is named, and a daughter of the late Sam Warner, who did much to make the name great in motion pictures. Good luck to the Benjamin Warner, sturdy ship and proud name. This is Republican nominee Dewey's adult family circle. His mother-in-law, his wife next to him, his mother, and Olo T. Hot, his father-in-law. The governor met his wife when both were music students, a family which may loom large in American history.